Welcome back to our fifth annual Future of U.S.-China Conference. And welcome to our viewers who are joining us virtually from all over the world. We are going to begin session seven. This panel is titled, China's Economic Outlook, Bullish or Bearish. This has been the highest performing topic on YouTube at this conference for us, and we very much anticipate hearing from our moderator, advisory council member, and investment strategist at Matthews Asia, Andy Rothman. Please welcome them. Thank you, Margaret. Welcome everybody here in the room and uh, on the internet. I am really excited to share with you this amazing panel that we've been able to get together to talk about the Chinese economy. Um, Immediately on my left here, Ma Guonan is a senior fellow at the Asia Society's brand new Center for China Analysis. Uh, he's got four decades of experience studying and writing about the Chinese economy. We've known each other for a long time. Uh, Guonan worked at some investment banks and at the Bank for International Settlement, which is a, a think tank for central banks around the world. Edith Young, next to him, is general partner at Race Capital, an early stage VC fund here in Silicon Valley. Edith's worked with many Fortune 500 companies and is also a frequent guest lecturer at Berkeley and Stanford. Welcome. Tom Orlick, next, is Bloomberg's chief economist. Prior to that, Tom was the Beijing-based China's China economics correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, and he's also worked at the British Treasury and the IMF. I also highly recommend his most recent book, China, The Bubble That Never Pops. <laughs> <laughs> Until it does, of course. <laughs> Great name. You're going to be signing autographed copies later? I'm available. <laughs> okay. And then our final panelist, Jacob Rothman, has been living and working in China since 2006, and he's the co-owner, along with a Chinese partner, of Vlong Enterprises, which is one of the world's largest manufacturers of grilling and kitchen tools. With about 1,000 employees for, in China, Vlong produces for brands such as Weber, Walmart, Target, and Home Depot. And in case you were wondering, there is no nepotism on this panel. <laughs> Jacob Rothman and I just met for the first time in person today. <laughs> as far as we're aware, we're not related. I want to apologize to everyone in the group who I've claimed to be Andy's cousin, sorry. <laughs> Um, but now that I've heard that, I think we're going to require a DNA test at the end of the panel. 23 and me, let's go. <laughs> okay. So the first thing we're going to do is um, address the question of, you know, are we bullish or bearish about the Chinese economy? The Chinese economy has over the last decade, uh, on average, accounted for about one third of global economic growth every year. That's a larger share of global growth than from the US, Europe, and Japan combined. But of course, it's been slowing down. The GDP growth rate, which is a year over year number, has been slowing steadily for a long time. But this comes on a, a big base. So even though the growth rate has slowed a lot, last year, the incremental expansion in the size of the Chinese economy was the biggest in China's history. But last year also was a pretty terrible year in the Chinese economy. Most of the downturn, in my view, was because of fear of lockdowns due to COVID. Other significant, significant contributing factors, of course, were really bad policy decisions on things like the property sector and regulation of the tech sector. So are we bullish or bearish? And before I ask the panel, I'm also going to ask you here in the studio audience to weigh in on this. Are you feeling bullish or bearish with the end of zero COVID and China's government saying they've rescinded some of the dumbest policies on property and on tech? Is the Chinese economy gonna bounce back to where it was before the pandemic? Still growing at a healthy but generally decelerating rate? Or did the problems during COVID just reveal structural deep problems in the Chinese economy and you're bearish because it's headed for poor performance or maybe even a crisis in the next couple of years. So before we turn to the panelists, I'd like the audience, raise your hand if you are bullish on the Chinese economy. Ooh, okay, raise your hand if you're bearish. 
All right, this is a tough audience. I think we need to bring the Jesse the Comedian back out up here. <laughs> All right, so I want to turn now first to Guanan. Are you bullish or bearish? I am uh, less bearish after the reopening. And for the simple reason that despite the uh, ongoing structural slowdown of the Chinese economy, the COVID and its post response are basically killing, the, uh, probably crushing the Chinese economy for, for some time already. And the recovery which will uh, happen, but uh, in my view, may not last. Okay, and I should mention for those watching online, the audience here definitely in the bearish camp. Edith, how about you? I'm, I'm bullish on Chinese economy longer term, but I'm bearish on Chinese internet economy. And I'm very bullish on Chinese founders in, because that's sort of where I come from. But I'm bearish in actually operating in China, particularly for the, for the internet side of things. So why, why are you bearish on the tech side when the government has just said they are, have now fallen back in love with internet platforms? Um, well, having said, just to set context, I just flew back from Hong Kong and also spent quite a few days in Singapore. And I swear to God, at least 80, 90% of all my internet sort of founders and investor friends, they're all actually located in, in Singapore. And so in many sense, I think the definition of tech learning from my cousin is actually have changed quite a bit. And what we sort of used to in the last 10 or 15 years, so sort of the BAT, by the way, when I say B is not Baidu, is actually ByteDance. Um, there's just so much going on. And you know, some of our fellow speakers that talked about, there's so much for the Americans to actually to learn uh, from the BAT of how they operate. But in the last two years, there's just so much unknown and then many of the Chinese founders, in fact, they're very lost, in many ways lost confidence mm -hmm. on what Beijing position on various you know, sectors, doesn't matter, is from the FinTech point of view and just stop the end IPO overnight in a few days. Wiped out $7 billion, $70 billion worth of value to basically take off, you know, DD off the, off the app stores, another $22 billion in value. Or even for ad tech sectors, you can't get, you, you can't make a profit. So it's just very, very difficult to understand and explain. And, but many of the founders are still really, really hungry. So moving to Southeast Asia, and they're not, you know, Tangping, they're not laying there. They still want to do things, and they're setting up new shops. And instead of focusing in China market, maybe in Southeast Asia. Okay, Tom. Um, so I think we have to think about the very short term, the slightly less short term, uh, and the long term. Um, so in the very short term, um, I think things are pretty bleak. Um, the sudden exit from COVID zero, the wave of infections that swept across China um, has clearly had a very significant negative impact on activity. Chinese people very sensibly are staying at home, voluntarily self-isolating, trying to dodge infection. We saw the impact of that in the big slump in the business survey data in December. Um, I think we'll see that again at the start of 2023. Looking slightly further out, looking out to the end of 2023, um, I think there is a significant boost to demand that comes um, as Chinese people get back to something resembling normal life. Um, so we think that rebound begins towards the end of the first quarter, beginning of the second quarter, and taken together with moves to remove some of the constraints on the property sector, uh, to ease back on uh, some of the crackdown on the private sector entrepreneurs and add a bit more stimulus to the system. Um, we think what that means is a Chinese economy which grew at probably a bit less than 3% last year um, will grow about 5% this year and in an upside scenario could even grow at 6% this year. Looking further out, looking onto a longer term trajectory, um, there's a bunch of really significant drags for China's economy. Demographics is a drag, debt is a drag, broken relations with the United States and all that means uh, for technology transfer is a drag. Um, so if you'd asked me a few years ago about China's long term growth, I would say 
they're probably on a glide path to a growth of around, annual growth of around 3% in the mid 2030s. Um, if you ask me today, uh, I would say risks to that scenario are significantly to the downside. Thanks. Jacob, as someone who's running a business in China, how are you feeling about? Well, first your of all, I'm a little future. upset because this water bottle is made in the United States. This is a manufacturer in China. It's, uh, it's not very welcoming, Andy. But um, I've been thinking about the question since you posed it over email. And uh, having went through the worst three years in my career, first we had President Trump, then we had the trade war, uh, then we had shipping crisis and COVID and over inventory. Now we're looking at recession. I wanted to say, uh, I wanted to say that I was uh, bearish. Um, but all of that has led to a situation where every single one of our customers wants a China plus one strategy. And whereas that was a nice to have uh, a few years ago, now it seems to be a must. And if you're talking to major customers in the consumer product space, uh, really anywhere on the planet, they want you out of China. But, I, so I could say bearish, right? That the best days of manufacturing are behind us. But I've also spent uh, the last three, four years researching Cambodia. We opened a factory there. Vietnam, uh, Turkey, India. I'm on my way next week to Mexico. Um, and I know that there is absolutely nothing on this planet that I've seen that beats the just-in-time, low-cost manufacturing ecosystem that we've all worked hard to build up in, in China. So I, I have to say I'm, I'm bullish on the future of manufacturing. Will some of it leak out? Yes. I, I myself am going to hopefully uh, lead manufacturing outside of China, but the majority of it's going to remain in China. That's my, my point of view. All right, thanks. So let's do another round and, and maybe focus on the Chinese consumer, because that's the biggest part of the Chinese economy. It's become a domestic demand-driven economy, more like ours. Uh, exports, as Wendy and James talked about in the first section here, have been a big part of the economy the last few years because of COVID issues. But I think pretty soon that's going to go back to where net exports, the value of China's exports minus their imports, is going to contribute zero to GDP growth like it did in the years before COVID. So we're talking about a domestic demand-driven economy. Chinese consumers have been on strike the last few years, but they've also been saving. Household bank accounts are up 44%, a net increase of five trillion US dollars since the beginning of COVID. Guanan, do you think that Chinese consumers are gonna start spending that again and we'll see that drive the economy again? That's a, a, a very likely event. Uh, we are going to see a meaningful rebound in the consumer spending in China. Uh, this, uh, you mentioned already there's a big jump in the household deposit. Uh, on the, on the, uh, at the same time, we are seeing reduced jobs, higher uh, unemployment, and reduced pay. So that means household income has been reduced, has taken a hit. While the, uh, that there's a big hit to the household income, we are also seeing a big jump in the uh, bank deposit uh, by, made by the household depo uh, households. That basically means uh, uh, the consu Chinese consumers have been very, very, very reluctant in opening their purses, at the same time also not touching the property market for a while. Yeah, Guanan raises a really good point about jobs. So I want to go back to Jacob, since you actually hire people in China. Where do you see the job market moving now that zero COVID is over? Well, I think we've all read that there's uh, 18 to 20 percent youth unemployment in China, right? So, uh, and there has been a slowdown uh, this year. Our, our numbers, uh, as an exporter, we don't focus on the domestic economy, are down this year about 30, 35 percent. Or I'm sorry, at the end of last year. So, you know, the job market in China is a little looser. It's a little easier to hire people, especially uh, in Shanghai where we have an office, but even in the second and third tier cities where we are, factory jobs are more available. A few years ago, we had to fight to get workers, um, and now we don't have to, so that has slowed down. Hmm. Tom, do you want to comment on consumer story, jobs, any element to this? Um, well, I mean, clearly the end of COVID zero um, is going to be a significant positive for consumption um, in the months ahead, right? 
uh, Chinese people have, uh, many Chinese people have been um, confronted with lockdowns, Shanghai and other parts of the country. Clearly that's impeded their capacity to go to restaurants, go to shops. That constraint is going to be removed. They're sitting on a bunch of savings, as Andy mentioned. Consumption is going to come back strongly from around the end of the first quarter and heading into the rest of the year. Um, looking further forward and thinking about some of the structural forces at work, um, I think there's still reason for optimism about the Chinese consumer story relative to the rest of the world. Um, but I think it's difficult to be optimistic about the China consumer story relative to the 10 years before the pandemic. Um, wage growth is going to be uh, slower. Um, there's probably going to be either no wealth boost from real estate or potentially a significant wealth drag from real estate. Um, and both of those things are going to weigh on consumption growth. Edith, what are your thoughts on what we've just been talking about here? Um, I haven't been to China for three years, so it's actually very unfair to comment on that. But I do wanted to share something which I found it very interesting and shocking, especially talking to some of the founders who recently moved out of China. And one of the reasons why they were they lost a lot of confidence is some of them actually worked in crypto and Web3. And, and one explanation that they have for me, which I found it shocking, was because related to the real estate and property market. And in the last past 10 or 15 years, a lot of the local government, one of their revenue source is actually selling land and related to real estate. And now it's not just for federal government or central government, it's really all layer of governments. Now there's no budget. And sometimes when they discover um, there is crypto component for a founder, they will actually get fined by the local governments and there is no way to fight it. So therefore, um, they will all of a sudden, the 50% of the reserve of a particular thing would just get fined, or therefore, and you can't even argue. So that's why some of these internet founders decided to, to leave, because it's actually quite difficult to understand what the policy is about. Okay, well that's actually a good lead in to the, the second question that I wanted to ask all of you, which is how you're feeling about prospects for private enterprise entrepreneurs in China. Because as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, this is the biggest part of the Chinese economy now. The, the private sector entrepreneurial driven companies account for 80% of urban employment in China. All of the net increase in new jobs, all of the wealth creation, all the innovation. but. A lot of people have been nervous about how Xi Jinping has been thinking about the private sector in the last several years. Uh, more recently, he said he's fallen back in love with entrepreneurs. Um, maybe I'll go back to Edith. How, since you've started talking about how your founders are thinking, um, what do you think? Are all the entrepreneurs going to flee China, or is there still room for them to start businesses and make money there? I, I'm not sure if I want them to love me per se. Um, and but, but at the same time, coming from an investor point of view, venture capital is all about investing in people. And, and again, because of my background, I'm very focused on internet economy. You see example of you know, Jet Ma disappear for a few months, or the founder CEO uh, of Ping Duodo had to step down, and, and also the founder CEO of uh, ByteDance also stepped down. And if you are a foreign investor investing or active in investing in Chinese internet economy, it definitely doesn't seem, there's not a whole bunch of, a lot of confidence um, in, in that sense. But having said that, I do think that technology in China is not just about internet. There's semiconductor, there's manufacturing, there's healthcare. Um, I think the shift in terms of what you know, Chinese government wanted to see is a little bit different from before. China is the only, sorry, I shouldn't say that, but definitely to operate in China is more important to have GR, which is government relations, more important than having investor relations. Because Chinese government is the biggest customer, is the biggest investor, is really, they drive the market. So therefore, as a investor point of view, it's gonna take some time for foreign investor to have that confidence in the private sector. Mm. 
You mentioned Jack Ma. Um, I was astounded in the last few months talking to investors here in the United States who almost inevitably the f one of the first questions they would ask me is, where's Jack Ma? And I'd say, well, why is that important to you? I mean, he no longer <laughs> runs Alibaba, but I could not get them away from that. So I was talking to Alibaba and I said, you know, it'd be great if you could get Jack to like wave to the cameras. <laughs> he doesn't even have to say anything, just show that he's out there. But they reminded me that he's no longer involved with the company directly. Yeah. Um, uh, going on, mm. bring that same question back to you. How are you feeling about private sector? Um, is it feasible that Xi Jinping and the rest of the party leadership is gonna turn their back for good on the people who are driving all the job creation in China? I think Xi Jinping and his team basically know that, knows the importance of the public sector in China. And they are, they've, in, the, in the past few months, they have been doing the right thing to try to comfort the, the private sector. But uh, it probably takes quite a few years for the private sector to be spawned, in my view. Uh, based on my observation that both the confidence and the balance sheet of the private sector has been heavily damaged in the past two years or so. And which will not easily be recovered and repaired. Okay. Tom, how are you feeling about that? Um, so a um, couple of points. Um, so uh, the first point is that um, I think that in Washington DC and in Wall Street, um, we get the common prosperity agenda wrong. Um, I think the instinct here in America is to frame the common prosperity agenda as uh, a kind of manifestation of the dysfunctions of China's communist regime. The CCP hates entrepreneurs, um, they're jealous or suspicious of entrepreneurs, and that's why we have the common prosperity agenda. Um, and perhaps that's part of it, uh, but I don't think that's the main motivation. Um, I think China has a really serious problem with inequality. China has a really serious problem with low fertility rates, which are partly a consequence of it just being really expensive to bring up a child in China. Um, and China, in common with the United States and Europe, um, also has a problem with tech monopolies run riot, right? So when I think about the common prosperity agenda and the motivation for the common prosperity agenda, I don't think about a CCP that hates entrepreneurs. I think about China's policymakers confronting a similar set of social and economic problems to policymakers in the United States and Europe and attempting to formulate a response. Admittedly, a partial, extremely poorly messaged and sometimes very crass response, but basically a response to genuine problems. Um, second point is that um, I think here in the US, we tend to frame the relationship between the state and the private sector in China in terms of conflict, right? It's Guo Jin Min Tui, um, or I guess sometimes it's Min Jin Guo Tui, less frequently. Um, okay, I think the, the comedian's uh, <laughs> job in the room is secure based on the response to that. Uh, so, um, uh, so um, um, but I don't think that's the right way of thinking about it, right? Um, think about the success of all of the entrepreneurs in uh, Guangdong and Zhejiang following China's entry into the WTO. Um, they succeeded, they had entrepreneurial endeavor, um, but who built their factories? Who ensured they had reliable access to power? Who built their telecommunication systems? It was all state-owned companies, right? So that kind of, that preeminent example of entrepreneurial success in China is actually an example of successful collaboration at a kind of macro level um, between the state sector and the private sector. Um, I think China's leadership understand that, um, and I expect that, rather than this idea of kind of continued kind of conflict and hostility between the two sides, actually to be the most important thing going forwards. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that Xi Jinping and everybody else in his leadership must be aware that the only reason that China's gone from being really poor when I first started working there to being quite wealthy now, and the only reason that the Communist Party is still in power is because of entrepreneurs in, in China. Um, so I would also agree with you. I think common prosperity is designed to try and mitigate 
solve some of the same problems that we have here with inequality of education and ac access to education and healthcare. And, but let's go back to Jacob. How, how do you see all of this? Um, you must work with a lot of private companies in China and have friends who are entrepreneurs there. How are they, how are they feeling right now? I see it a little bit differently from what I read in the news and when I see conferences like this. Um, often what's focused on is celebrity entrepreneurs. Um, uh, Jack Ma, you mentioned, uh, Wei Ya in Hangzhou that got shut down. Although, you know, it's possible that you're now in that celebrity entrepreneur category because you've been quoted in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times twice in the last few months. Um, well, I did at the Palace Hotel um, relieve myself at a, in a public bathroom with, with, with Jack Ma. So other than that, <laughs> okay. I'm standing next to him, I thought I'd get it out there. I'm not sure I want to hear the rest of that story, but... There wasn't anything left. It was just I was there, he was there, I looked at him, he looked at me. It was, it was an exchange, but uh, uh, anyway. You, you didn't get a photo for Alibaba investors? In the bathroom? It, 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 it was before COVID, so he was still around. But uh, So you have celebrity entrepreneurs, you have EV, you have uh, very high profile things going on, but um, that's not my world, right? I. I I make spatulas, right? I joke with my son who groans, and you'll groan too, that I'm a spatulist, right? Uh, <laughs> right? Where's the comedian? I'm after you. <laughs> but, uh, so within that group of manufacturers, which actually represents the majority of things, the chairs you're sitting on, the cups, not this one, uh, the bottle that uh, is next to me, it's the majority of what fills up uh, a retail chain, right? Um, so that's not something that usually gets reported in the news, but it is the majority of people that I work with, work around, and things that I do. And, and, and for that, um, I don't have anything but uh, gratitude and respect for a government that's managed the longest prolonged economic uh, advancement in, in almost the history of the world. Uh, Tom, you mentioned power and water and these types of things. They, well, they wouldn't exist. Uh, I've tried to go to India and manufacture products, Infrastructure there is terrible. It's not in China, right? Um, and I learned this lesson because sometimes I get hung up on the news. I read the uh, newspapers and I think, oh my gosh, this is terrible. I got to get out of here. But um, when we got published uh, in, in the Wall Street Journal, I was super excited, right? For us who started with pretty much a dirt floor factory and 20 years later we're in this place. For me it was like hitting a baseball and, uh, and, and getting a home run in Yankee Stadium. I put it on my LinkedIn, I put it on Facebook, I sent it to every friend of mine and I put it on WeChat, right? WeChat. My partner Ivan Chen didn't. And I asked him, you know, what, what's with this? Why, didn't, why, didn't, why weren't you proud of this? Why weren't you excited? This is one of the biggest moments in our entire career. And he said, I want to be respectful of the government that helped us get here. So from my point of view, there's no crackdown. Um, common prosperity, I think it's a good idea, frankly. How it gets executed, well, hopefully it gets executed in a way that works for everybody, but um, from my point of view, things are fine for the private uh, sector in, in the manufacturing field. Okay, let's, uh, let's now turn to another question for the panel. What are you worried about? What are the biggest risks in your mind? Because there's a lot of risks out there, and a lot of them we've talked about, other panels have discussed today, demographics, uh, local government debt, the property market, um, TikTok. What are you guys worried about? Edith, let's start with you. I have so many things that I worry about, but, but um, so a couple of days ago when I was in Hong Kong, and we have a few friends, from China, from Hong Kong, uh, got together talking about various di different topics. But one of the topics was, so uh, what, what other passports are you working on? Like what other places, like do you actually have residency or citizenship? And, and after that conversation, I made a comment. I'm like, I never had that kind of conversation being in America. No American wants to have any other passport but their own, but yet, at least, I guess, you know, folks that I interact with, mostly in the investment or in the internet economy, they're all thinking about having another passport. So what I worry about is brain drain. And I think that, you know, after all, it's not just about making money, it's actually about security and be able to keep it 
after you build something great. And in that sense, I wish that more and more Chinese entrepreneurs and founders, we already have the first generation. The ideal is just like Silicon Valley, this first generation will continue to invest and support the local ecosystem. If they all leave the country, who else left to support them? And this is something that I hopefully, there will be change of policy, there will be you no know, better exit path for all of them to stay because it's very important for China. Let me go back to you, Jacob, now with, with a preliminary question, which is in, among your business and personal contacts in China, are you hearing people worrying about getting out, getting another passport, leaving, leaving the country? And then after that, what, what do you think is the biggest risk facing China? Well, if I'm being honest, um, I live in Shanghai. Uh, most of the parents who attend my son's school, the Shanghai American School, many of them either have other passports um, or are considering moving. Right? I mean, that is a reality. Things, um, uh, things have gotten difficult, and after three years of being you know, locked down, scanned, swabbed, uh, everything else that's happened, uh, I mean, we were stuck in our house for two months, right? Um, so I think that's created frustration, but I think it will ease. Um, and when they go abroad um, and live in another country, especially when uh, China and Chinese people are, are targets of microaggressions around the world, I, I think they'll want to come back, frankly. Um, and the second part of the question, I'm not an economist. I don't understand the intricacies of finance and property markets. I, I, for me, the biggest problem is diplomacy. My, uh, my issues and problems or challenges started in President Trump's administration. I think some of the things he had to say were okay. I think we need to have frank discussions with uh, partners and uh, people we compete with, but in the way in which we did it, how hostile it became, the attacks on China, that's my biggest problem. We need to return to a time where we can have frank, open, respectful conversations and allow for China to develop as an equal partner in the world. And until that diplomacy happens, until 80% of the United States changes their views on China, we're going to have problems. And there's no reason for these problems to exist. They're cheap political plays on the part of politicians, and I really wish they'd stop. Diplomacy, that's my biggest problem. Do you think that Chinese people are starting to get angry at America, just not the government, but people? I, I think whether you look at the Chinese dream or make America great again, it's similar banter, and I think you can use it to rile up people to your political end, but I've never felt uncomfortable in China. I've never felt more than welcomed, appreciated. Um, my wife is Chinese, my son is a mix, and uh, we live there quite comfortably. The people I'm around, um, and, and I'm around everyone from authors and doctors and lawyers and artists and business people to factory workers, and, uh, and I've never, ever, in 20 years of been, being in China, felt the type of uh, negative attitudes that we have here towards Chinese people. Mm. And I wish it would come to an end. There's no reason for it. Uh, Guonan, let's turn to you. What, what are you most worried about? What do you think the biggest risks are? Okay, in, the, in the near term, cyclically, I, I'm reasonably bull, uh, positive and bullish. But uh, medium term, I have two major concerns. Uh, one is that the private sector I mentioned earlier, that even the private sector can be stabilized before long, in my view. But China needs a robustly expanding private sector to get it going. And that may not happen anytime soon, in part because both confidence and the damaged balance sheet. And I'm worried about that part. And look at Japan. Um, the second part is that some of these structural factors tends to be, in China, tends to be amplified and interact with, with, uh, with each other. For example, the, the worsening demographics probably will have a serious uh, implication for the property sector in China. And the property sector in China, in turn, will probably have uh, big consequences for the local government debt. Um, and local government uh, debt issue is, uh, is, is building up 
fairly uh, robust, uh, fast in, in my view, and probably we will not be on a, uh, at a sustainable pace uh, in, uh, going forward. Um, so this demographic property and government debt, they tend to amplify each other, and hopefully Beijing can handle this situation dynamics carefully to make sure that, that it will not be a, a, a vicious uh, cycle there. Okay, I'm gonna ask uh, Tom Orlick to weigh in on this and then after that we'll go to your questions in the audience. Uh, so firstly, just briefly on Edith's point about uh, no one in America uh, looking for passports for foreign countries, um, I recall a particular moment, I think it may have been around November 2016, um, <laughs> when at least a couple of people had that instinct, but I'm sure you're right, in, in general it's more of a problem uh, for China. Um, so uh, what worries me wo most about um, the outlook for China, uh, well I want to tie back to, to the excellent discussions we, we kicked off the day with uh, on, on trade and semiconductors. Um, so if you think about what has driven China's four decade development miracle, uh, put kind of crudely, it was the capacity to beg, borrow and steal foreign technology and then put that technology to work at enormous scale in the Chinese market and by doing that create some world beating products and some world beating companies. And we saw that happen time and time again from simple things like textiles and toys uh, in the 1980s um, through metals and chemicals in the 1990s, supercharged by WTO, WTO entry, um, and then hitting more advanced products like high-speed trains and sustainable energy um, in more recent years. Um, now what's happened since the beginning of the Trump administration and even more with the Biden administration um, is that access to foreign technology is being turned off. Um, in particular, access to leading edge semiconductors uh, which underpin basically all technological developments has been turned off. Um, now we'll have to see how that plays out but if strictly, implicate, if strictly implemented by the United States and its allies I think that chokehold on China's access to semiconductors threatens to turn China into a kind of Amish community uh, with its technological development frozen in place. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff we can worry about. We can worry about demographics, we can worry about debt, we can worry about brain drain. Um, but I would put that diplomatic breakdown and all it means for China's access to leading edge global technology up there near the top of the list of big worries for the next decade. Okay, thanks. So let's turn to the audience now. Do we have some questions for this great panel? Please raise your hand. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Rodrigo Albertin from the Asian Foundation. Uh, if, if we have a debate on the global economic outlook, at some point we will start talking about the green transition. But that was a missing point in this conversation. So I, I, I don't know if that was on purpose or what are your views on the net zero transition on the, on the, 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 the net carbon reduction from the Chinese economy and how that's playing a role or not in the near and, and medium term economic uh, output. Okay. Anybody want to take a go at that? I think uh, the green transition in China has been reasonably well in my view, in part because of the important role played by the private sector. Uh, especially in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the solar panel uh, sector, which has been mostly private sector driven. Uh, and in fact, that's also beating the US. Talk about the choke point uh, technology. Um, that, uh, before long, I will, I will anticipate uh, that trans uh, the US government will try to complain that uh, there's an unfair trade in, in, in the solar panel <laughs> sector by the US. <laughs> okay. I, I want to add one comment. Please. Uh, I don't know about 2022 because of all the lockdown, but uh, for 2021, Tesla made more cars in Shanghai than they do in Fremont. And I, the EV industry, I actually think is super vibrant, which is sort of go back to supporting green. Um, in China more so than in the U.S. in some sense. And I, I remember a few months ago, I went to, um, I don't know why I was invited, but I, I went to a car 
uh, festival, a tech conference, they're talking about all sort of from Web3 to, to green. And I was shocked to hear from some of the German car manufacturer telling me that they really was late to the game. Most of the Chinese uh, car manufacturing actually bought out a lot of the African mine for the raw material that make battery. And so a lot of the Chinese players actually have really laid the foundation, um, particularly on the battery production, and it's quite ahead of the game. So um, it's, it's great to, to, to hear, and I think China is leading the way. Yeah, and getting back to what you guys were talking about, about the risks on diplomacy, I think this is one of the biggest risks is that you know the climate issues cannot be solved without real cooperation between the U.S. and China. And you can argue that China's gonna do what's in China's own interest, which is to try and reduce pollution and increase energy efficiency anyway. But the requirements for cooperation on the scientific side, on the demonstration side, I don't know, maybe Gary uh, on his panel that's coming up after ours can talk a little bit about what he's been involved in. But without real cooperation between the two sides, just like on cancer treatments, it's gonna take a lot longer to get to where we all need to be. Do we have a, another question? Uh, hi, this is uh, Matt Boswell again from Stanford Center on China's Economy and Institutions. Uh, one of the scholars that's affiliated with our, our center uh, recently published a couple of studies tracking the rise of party cell or party units within uh, in, in corporate boardrooms as mandated by the central government. Um, as in addition to that, there's a rise, at least in pilots in, in certain provinces, of uh, social or corporate social credit scores. And I'm curious, you know, the research just tracks the, the expansion of, of this phenomenon. It doesn't get very far into what the implications of that are, or if it's just window dressing, or, uh, you know, how, sub is it just, is how substantive uh, should we think about these trends in your experience? Or is that something that crosses your radar screen, and should we care? I can take part of it if you like. Um, so I've heard of larger businesses uh, having that happen, uh, being asked to join a common prosperity and give a portion of their uh, profits to something that helps the common prosperity. Um, it hasn't filtered down to second and third tier cities like ours. Um, there are local government involvement. We get called to a governmental meeting every two, three months, uh, and they talk about issues. It's mostly about how to overcome sort of the down, uh, the downward trend right now that we have in exports. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they started talking about that, um, and I'd welcome it. Um, so just just briefly, um, let's think for a moment about the kind of the slightly longer historical sweep of the China corporate story, right? If we were having this conversation 20 years ago, um, the exciting Chinese firms that we would have been talking about are state-owned bank ICBC, state-owned steel company Bao Steel, state-owned telecom company China Telecom, um, and a bunch of other state firms, right? Now, what are we talking about at events like this? We're talking about Tencent, we're talking about ByteDance, we're talking about Alibaba, we're talking about some of the exciting companies that Edith and other um, uh, early stage investors are putting money into, right? So I think the kind of the big sweep of the corporate story in China over the last 20 years um, is not a story of the state advancing and the private sector retreating, right? The big story is the story of the emergence of a bunch of really dynamic, really innovative, in many cases, world-beating private sector Chinese firms. And now the Chinese government, in common with many other governments in the world, is saying, you know what? These big internet companies, which have monopolies and which have access to data on every single one of us, um, and which are using that power in some cases to stymie the rise of competitors or to gouge their suppliers or to milk their customers, maybe we need to take a little bit of a stronger view on regulating those companies. Um, for me, that's not evidence of a kind of 
resurgent state sector which is threatening the dynamism of the private sector, for me, that looks like regulators more or less doing their job. Yeah, and I'd add back when I could still travel around China before COVID, um, I spent some time visiting very small private companies, um, you know, a couple hundred people in a, in a factory, uh, maybe making spatulas for Jacob. Oh. Uh, <laughs> no. um, and, and what I found is that they were all pushed to create a party organization, but when I pushed them to go into detail what it was about, it seemed like it was a trade-off. The party was saying, we'll create a channel for you to come back to us and basically be an ombudsman. Any problem you have with the government, uh, permits, licensing, tax issues, we'll solve them for you. In return, we want a channel to be able to distribute literature on the wit and wisdom of Xi Jinping to your workforce. But when I'd ask the companies, is the party now interfering in what you sell, how you price, where you source, they, they all scoffed at that and said that no one would want to do that. And if they tried, they wouldn't let them because it's a private company. Um, and then last part of your question was about social credit. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about that issue here. And I, we don't really have time to go into it now because we need to wrap up. But if you're on Twitter, I would suggest looking at uh, an account called China Law Translate. Um, they've done some fantastic work on trying to demystify what the social credit scoring system is about in China. And with that, I want to wrap up and ask you to thank our terrific panelists.